I'm Sheetal Astogi, Editorial Director at World Travel Magazine. I welcome you all to World Travel Magazine's wellness webinar. We have participants from over 30 countries joining us today. We are going through an unprecedented time as our normal, give, normal gives way overnight and we are all forced into the new way of life. With mind-boggling statistics on infections and deaths finding their way into our awareness on an hourly basis, positivity is in short supply. As most of us enter into another week of physical isolation, the topic of wellness becomes ever more relevant. In times like this, we need to consciously take care of ourselves even more, physically and mentally. The objective of this session is to help us learn more about how we can maintain mental well-being and boost our immune system during these turbulent times. Let's take this as an opportunity to learn, grow, and strengthen ourselves from within. I'm joined by our wellness experts, Jamie Waring and Grace Zhu. Jamie is the Managing Director of Wellness at Octave Institute. He brings more than 30 years of experience leading teams and business units within the hospitality and wellness industries. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you. And we have Grace, who's life coach at Sangha Retreat by Octave Institute. Grace is the national consultant, psychologist grade two, a registered hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. Grace is also an expert in holistic wellness with a background in medical, psychological and spiritual education. Welcome, Grace. In today's, in today's session, Grace and Jamie will be addressing the need for mental well-being in current times and how to deal with stress and fear. At the end of the session, we will have a short Q&A. You can send in your questions on the Q&A chat of your Zoom platform. And now over to you, Jamie. So how does one start on a wellness journey? Oh, good question. You know, I think it's, um, I think we have really an unprecedented situation right now. I mean, as you mentioned, we really have a time when none of us have been through this before. And what it does do, it does bring wellness to the forefront. You know, it brings wellness and really how to be well right into the consciousness of people. And, you know, to shame in some respects that it comes to such a situation for people to start thinking about this, but really, this is where we're at. And none of us have been here before. It's unknown. And obviously, in this situation, you know, we, there are so many unknowns. It's inevitable people feel totally stressed. Um, the fact that we have to be isolated at home you know, is a very strange situation. The truth is most of us before this time pray for more time at home, right? You know, we, we never always complain of not enough time at home with family to do all those projects and things that we want to do. And, um, but now we're forced in situations, not the same context. And people feel really out of it don't know what to do with themselves, you know? And I think the mental wellness and mental health is also the forefront of this and actually how we, you know, how we can actually make a few changes, a few alterations to really support people. And the point of today's session really is to try and give some, you know, some surrounding information, but some practical tips, because obviously in the end, it has to make sense for people, right? It has to make sense and has to be implementable for people. And especially in a strange situation where we're stuck in our house in a very forced situation, it really is difficult. You know, on top of this, we have, you know, we're force fed 24 seven, the horror stories from the media and <clears throat> wherever you digest your news from, you know, social media or old school TV, whatever, the fact is that it's kind of, it's very concerning and we're actually brainwashed with all these images and these facts. And, and we, it's kind of slightly voyeuristic, you know, we kind of watch this stuff and it doesn't really help. It doesn't really, we're getting some information, but really it's just, we can't help ourselves. But what it does do, it really drives up this kind of level of tension within ourselves because we can't do anything about it. We kind of feel, we feel slightly in a victimhood, you know? We feel so we're kind of surrendered to the situation. And you know, so wellness and mental health is really key to how we kind of can move forward. The truth is, in my opinion, we have a real opportunity here. You know, this situation is forcing us to be reflective both on an individual perspective and on a global perspective. We've never had a situation like this before where it's affecting the total globe. So I think we have a real opportunity here and actually a real opportunity to stop and actually to look at our lives in a kind of deeper way. 
Um, you know, my colleague Grace will go through some specific tips on how we can help stress in a second, but I want to give some context because really, you know, we, we have a real gift here in a way. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen. There's so many unknowns, but what we do know are things that we can do on a daily basis to help ourselves, you know? And this means really, look at some of this self-development stuff. Read that book you've been meaning to read for years. Connect with your family and friends, the people you've been meaning to touch base with and haven't for years. These are all amazing opportunities that you can be really proactive with rather than sitting in kind of victimhood of I'm a victim, I'm stuck here. It's a frame of mind. We need to change our frame of mind, our context, you know? Really, I think that's, a, that's my key kind of thing, first of all. You know, but this whole situation is really, as far as I'm concerned, is a wake-up call, right? It's a wake-up call for all of us, but on a very personal basis, it's a wake-up call. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it's obviously a, a time to reflect on what is our life about? You know, what are we living for? You know, what kind of, in, in a materialist world, what are we driving for? And is this really what we need and want? And do we have an opportunity here to kind of reflect and redesign our lives and reinvent ourselves somewhat? Now, I think this is really an important time. And actually, to also just look at some home truths here. I think what we've seen over the last few weeks is that how kind of delicate and vulnerable this whole system is. It's taken just a few weeks and we're kind of, the economies are starting to crash or soon will on unemployment rates. And of course, the healthcare system. And I think this is something we need to really look at and something in Octave Institute and Sanger Retreat we really work hard on is the educational side of things because people need to understand that, you know, you, you as an individual have to take responsibility for your health. The days have gone where you can actually delegate this to a third party or delegate this to a hospital or to a healthcare system. The healthcare system is really a sick care system, meaning that you have to be sick before you go to the hospital. It's not a lifestyle, but what we're teaching at Sanger Retreat is that, look, look at your life, take responsibility for how you live. And in a very simple way, it makes a big difference, but actually you have to take responsibility for this. And I think this experience has shown us this, that actually we need to bring responsibility back to ourselves. And what does that mean? It's not very complicated, right? I mean, this is really a back to basic stuff. This is really about, you know, how, how we breathe. Do we breathe properly? The water we drink, the diet, of course, is fundamental. What kind of food do we eat? Are we eating real food? Because most of us don't. So most of us don't really know what that means. And I think that these are very basic things. And these, if you get these three things in, even before we move into being conscious and mindfulness, we actually create a much more healthy environment than ourselves, which means that you, your immunity is boosted through this very simple approach. And actually, this is kind of taking care of your own health. Then we have exercise, movement, mindfulness, and the most important thing, and I'm sure you've heard of blue zones and blues, there's five or six blue zones around the world. And these are locations where people live to really good, good ages, up to 100. And there's many factors which go towards this, but the whole thing is a lifestyle. And one of the key ingredients, which I think is really important to mention, is community. You know, the, new, the need for social interaction and community is key to mental well being and health and longevity. And what does this mean? I think. In our strive for globalization, you know, we kind of have lost the local, we've lost the neighborhood connections, you know, and I think one thing this, well, another positive to come from this, I think will be the connection and the connectivity with our neighborhood, with our local environment, our local community. And it's proven that actually these kind of basic relationships are profound and actually create such a, such a health and longevity um, and of course, strong mental, well health, mental health I think this, these are the kind of key ingredients, really, which I think give some context. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, Thank you. I mean, I was going to actually then probably pass on to, to Grace, and Grace Please. will actually give some more kind of science behind some practical tips I think we can look at for actually how we can improve stress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you, Jamie. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Grace, and nice to meet you here. And I'm going to talk about well-being at this moment. And allow me to share the. So if I, if I ask you what's the top one challenge for maintaining or being mental wellness, mental well-being, what it will be? It's stress. 
So based on WHO, stress is the epidemic disease of the 21st century. And especially during this period of time, self-quarantine, we, we don't know tom about tomorrow when it will get over. So even larger issue at this moment is stress. So how to deal with it? But before that, let me to do a quick self-check. So uh, everyone, uh, please take a comfortable position and gently close your eyes. And then gently take a couple of deep breaths. Then ask yourself this question. On the scale of 10, how would I rate my stress level? Normally, the first number pops out is the correct number. So, and in addition to that, still stress has some som many somatic symptoms, and we can double check whether we have this. For example, headache, insomnia, stomachache, or digestion problem, or migraine, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, diabetes, or older skin problem. So if we have this, it's a big chance that we're already quite stressed up. So how to deal with that? Normally, we will divide it into three levels. The first one is the mind, use mindful ways to do the stress reduction. The level two is all kind of psychological interventions. It's very effective. And for the level three, it's actually, I try to give you a big chopper. <laughs> So it's all about cognitive upgrading. Today, I, I will mostly I will focus on the level one is the mindfulness to deal with stress. And uh, I will briefly introduce the level two and the three. So the first one is mindful stress reduction. Why mindfulness? Because mindfulness is the most classic way to deal with, to reduce stress. There are tons of research prove that. For example, this, this one, it shows that after eight weeks of mindful uh, practice, all the symptoms reduced to half. So it's a very good data. For example, anxiety, depression, all the sim physical symptoms, they all reduce to half. And this proof is a, that it's a really important paper. It's kind of milestone paper that what, after you do a long-term um, meditation, actually if I, scan your brain, we can see that really there are three regions of the brain that have structure change. So it's really a big thing, a big deal. So everyone heard of mindfulness, but actually what exactly is mindfulness? Here's the definition. It's simply is awareness. It's to pay attention in a special way. Pay attention to the current moment, non-judgmentally. Very simple, that is mindfulness. And normally, what can we observe? We have every moment we have our surroundings and we use five sense to observe it or aware of it. But most important is we will observe or aware of ourselves. What can be, we observe ourselves? Basically, there are three categories. Our thoughts, our emotions, our physical sensations. As long as we pay attention to these three major categories, at every moment, we are doing the mindful practice. So that's very simple. And uh, many of you might be saying that I don't like meditation. I cannot sit there for, for an hour, something like. So actually, mindful practice is not all about meditation, or not only about meditation. There are a whole bunch of ways. For example, you can take a walk, mindful walk or yoga, Plati or even dancing, fishing, and uh, also something called life zen. That means you can practice it all the time, every day, 24 hours, such as washing dishes, cook, bake a, bake a cake, or even mow your lawn. Yeah, something like that. You can do it all the time. But the most important, just keep in mind, there are two key points to practice that. First one is based on the, both of them actually based on the natural nature of the anxiety. Anxiety is the sustained state of fear. So based on that, we have two key points. 
first we want to interrupt or we want to break this kind of sustained state of fear. So we'll stop it and it's better to stop it multiple times each day. So just, just look at this cucumber. We can take this as a stress and the mindfulness as this knife. We want to cut it multiple slices each day. So uh, an easy way to do that is build up a routine especially right now, it could be a challenge. I heard many people said, well, right now my daily routine is completely gone. I, I just get up whenever I like. I, I, don't fall, I don't go to bed during the midnight. That's actually will, how to say, will even make your stress worse. <laughs> so a basic bottom line routine or, ba or bottom line framework is very important during this special time and also try to remember at least put four or five times mindful practice each day to get the better effect. And uh, actually, uh, once one client come to me said, well, I am quite stressed, but I actually I do mindful meditation almost every day, each time one or two hours. So he said, I just wonder why it's not work so well. I said, if you want to reduce your stress, actually it's much better for you to take, instead of one hour meditation each or every couple of days, better that you do the mindful practice every time three to five minutes, and then every one or two hours you did it once. It can be the same or it can be di different. For example, you can take a walk in the morning and also after lunch, take a, a 20 minutes meditation, all kind of mindful practice, it will work better. And at this moment, I want to introduce you of my personal favorite, a practice called one minute distress breathing. Uh, it's very simple. Just sit there or lying there or standing there, everything, every position is, is okay. And you just slowly close your eyes, take a deep, slowly take a deep breath from your nose and then very slowly breathing out through your mouth, very slowly. Just imagine there's a tiny little, little tube in front of your mouth. So you can slowly exhale out from the mouth. And you try to do this, do this way for four times. Normally four times is one minute. And uh, after four times, you will feel much better. For example, one time a client told me said, actually her basic stress level is not high. Actually, he to she told me it's like that in the office and then suddenly it will, something happened and it will serve, serve out. So she asked me how to do, and I introduced this practice to her, I said, it, it's perfect actually for her case, based on my personal experience. For example, once I just finished a, a workshop and uh, carried my computer to waiting for the elevator to back to my office. And then I checked my cell phone and found, found a message, told me the next day afternoon, I will have another workshop in a totally different, a new workshop. I, I never prepared PPT for that. So, my first reaction is anxiety. I'm, uh, I'm freaked out almost. And then I feel a little upset. I said, well, how come these kind of things always happen? And I try to recall when is the last time who did that for me. And then I suddenly realize, well, I'm the person teaching stress reduction. Definitely I can find some, something that it can make me feel better because I'm standing there waiting for the elevator so I cannot actually, actually do the sitting meditation. So I try this one minute distress breathing only four times and I check myself, mm, much better. And I, because the elevator didn't come, so I check, do another four times and I check myself completely, com completely well. So I strongly suggest this method and especially this one can, fitting any tight schedule of yours later. So I recommend, suggest you to, to try, that, try on that. And something else, in addition to the mindful uh, 
stress reduction, something else is we, we call it anti-stress hormone, oxytocin. We also call it a cattle hormone. Especially during this special period of time, we actually have much longer time or opportunity to stay with our family. So we can use that as long as it's a positive interpersonal interaction, your oxytocin will express and it will reduce your stress. So family, pets, or a stuffed animal, or blanket, all kind of thing will work. And I quickly go through the, next, the second part is the, uh, I'm quite sure that during these days, many of you heard of the immune function a lot because they will say that if you have good high immune function, uh, it, it will protect you from the virus infection. And, uh, but how to use psychology to help you boost your immune function? It's a quite new, a relatively new science called psychoneuroimmunology. It's all about how your mind interact will influence your immune system. It's all about how you think, what you feel will have direct impact on your effect on your immune system. So, for example, if you have stress or, or if you have fear, there will two pathways which will lead to the damage of the your damage your immunity. So my suggestion is first, you have to control the negative intake, the, the intake of negative income information. It's very easy. You just put, a, put away your cell phones, don't check so many negative news. So that's the one. The second suggestion is the mindful practice, as I just mentioned. Uh, there's an experiment, there's a study showed that after eight weeks mindful practice, the immune function doubled. So it's quite, it's a, a quite a lot. So the third part, the, finally the last part is the cognitive upgrading. Why that is important, why it's really relevant? Because that's my personal favorite, neurological levels. The basic rule for that is the solution can be easily found at higher level. So if you look at the higher level, it's all about your belief system, your value ranking, your identity, and who, who you are, why you live for. So all that is the higher level. So that makes changing thinking habit, check belief system, and updating your worldview make it so important. That comes to the last slide. So we call it as inside, so outside. So that means all that upper level belief system, worldview, these kind of things stay behind, stay inside your subconscious, and that is important. So if you want to have an outside, happily abundant life, actually you have to make an effort to work in your inside, to, to straight your value ranking, to double check your belief system, because you can create your own reality in this way. So yeah, basically that's it. And uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. That, that, was, you. that was really insightful. Uh, uh, God, I think I have to see the presentation again and make my own list of how <laughs> I plan too much. to- uh, <laughs> Oh, no, it's 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 pretty uh, uh, good, and I think uh, I'm gonna that's that's gonna be a homework for me. That at night I'm gonna make a list of how I plan to start uh, because a lot of things that you addressed, and I think each one of us is at some stage uh, facing uh, these these challenges, uh, and and we've got uh, some some really challenging and interesting questions from our readers and viewers. So uh, I'll, I'll open the floor for questions and probably uh, our, our viewers will get uh, uh, you know, responses to specific issues that, that they are facing at the moment. I'll take the first question. Uh, it's how to go about creating a space for wellness at home during this isolation time. It's day 10 and my partner and child have destroyed my zen. Yeah, actually, I can totally relate because I have stayed with my husband and my teenager daughter for almost three months in the <laughs> in apartment. Yeah. Wow. So 
Yeah, I know that's challenging, and I want to uh, give that advice. Is first is to try to find your own location. It's the space actually. Try to find that one, and uh, actually the second one is the the time. Normally, for example, normally I will try to t tell them whenever I feel that they are not need me most. For example, after the breakfast, after lunch, or or before dinner, <laughs> things like that. I will talk to them that, well, I'm going to do a meditation. It will take one hour. So if you need anything, ask me now. So they will actually they will respect my space or respect my time. So that actually work. And the third thing actually I learned from my husband and the daughter, that they use headphones a lot <laughs> to actually shield make their own space and uh, will keep them to themselves. And uh, actually there are a deeper reason for that because I observed that the person like my husband and my daughter, they don't have the issue like that. They will, they will feel totally free, in, in disruptive, and uh, yeah, very, very, very easy to stay in home because they are kind of person, how to say, self-centered, <laughs> or they are, have very good ability to take care of themselves. But for me, each time somebody raises up, I will ask, well, do you need anything Can I for your kind of drink? So I realize it's my personal or per personality problem. So it's problem is my problem. I need to learn to respect my own time, me time, or put myself in a more important place in my heart. So I think that's the deeper reason for that. Yeah. So, okay. Sure. Moving to the next question, um, we have uh, from one of the viewers. Uh, I'm wondering what the new normal will be post COVID. What's the new new uh, normal will be post COVID? Jamie, would you like to take this uh, on? That's a, that's, a, that's a really big question. <laughs> we don't know, right? I mean, we can guess, and you know, we can actually. You know, we can all kind of get together and you see the, the news and people are doing this now and what's going to happen in two months, three months when it's all done. Nobody knows. But I think this is why it's so vital that we take some kind of responsibility back to ourselves, because the only thing in the end, all these things are really out of our control, you know, and this is part of the challenge. We don't like being out of control generally. In our life, our, the status quo has changed. You know, the new normal, I mean, I'd, I have no idea. I can guess like the rest, but it's not particularly helpful. I think what is helpful is actually to look at the things you can control. And the things you can control are the things we're talking about today. You know, your health, your well-being, you know, your reflection, the time you take for yourself to really kind of build and think about what you really want, as opposed to being washed, or washed about and down the stream, you know, kind of helpless. Actually really thinking about when this, and it will change and we'll go back Go back to normal, I'm not sure 100%, but things will change soon. But the truth is, what do you want from this? Do you want to go back to how things were? Or is this a real, opp real opportunity to actually redefine that for yourself? Moving on to the next question. Uh, do you have any suggestion for a book on meditation? The problem is there are too many. <laughs> you can any, go any to the library. Uh, or, or a webinar on meditation techniques? Actually, I just personally, I just read a book about mindfulness and depression. And I feel it's very helpful actually for our ordinary people, not only for depression. So there are a lot of practical ways to control your mind or to control your thinking. So actually, that's my personal favorite at this moment. So how about yeah, look, I'd like to, Yeah, no, I'd like to add, I mean, I think you know, and this is, this is my opinion, but I think I'd like to say that, you know, meditation is not an end with itself. You know, meditation is a tool to make you become present, right? Yeah. And the problem with meditation or the challenge people have is that there's so many different forms and so many different approaches that people just get totally lost in this kind of mass of different things. But the reality is, let not, don't lose sight that the rea this meditation is a, is a means to become present. That's all. So as Grace showed in her presentation, that means, you know, whatever you're doing, you can be present doing. And your hobby, 
reading, being present. You are, in fact, you are present if you know it or not. The problem is our mind thinks we're not. And when we're thinking about it, we're actually away from the present moment. But if you allow yourself just to be reabsorbed into the present moment, you're present, and that is meditation. So the truth is very simple. There's no right or wrong because people, I think, also become very, very self-judgmental in regards to, am I doing it right? You know, I'm not doing meditation right. And this is really contrary to the whole point because the whole point is you're allowing your thinking mind just to calm down and be where you're at without judgment. And so really, it's a tool, that's all. I wouldn't get too lost in all the techniques. I think what's most vital is that you have to find something which works for you, which is practical, which like Ray said, you know, not many people can go from nothing to do one hour every day. You know, maybe one minute at a time, maybe five minutes. Just taking these little mindful breaks where you're present, where you're, you know, you're looking at your eyes without thought, where you're smelling without you know, taking into a thought, where you're hearing sounds. This is being present, this is a meditation. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, any suggestions or programs or tips that can be followed by corporates once we resume work to ensure the mental well-being of our employees are looked upon, especially any quick, less time-taking programs? You can pick these. <laughs> less time making, sorry, what was that last, less time-taking programs? Uh, uh, any less time taking programs? Look, I mean, I think corporate wellness is, you know, is key to your whole life because really it's difficult to divide your life up into my personal life, my working life. You know, I think it's all your life, right? And we spend a crazy amount of hours at work and the demand on people is increasingly to spend more time at work. You know, especially in Asia, I've, you know, worked and lived in Asia for many years. There's a real demand to work many hours. And I think employees need to really understand you know, how they take care of their team, how they take care of their people through, one, the environment, making sure they have an environment which allows them to kind of be at work. In fact, I was in the US a few months ago and I had some companies. And what I saw increasingly is they're building these little rooms for kind of meditation and timeout rooms where people, and you know, just a bit bigger than a cupboard, nothing too grand, but actually allowed a space where people could come and just switch off because we're overwhelmed by digital, we're overwhelmed by social media. We have our phones with us the whole time. So how do we switch off? You know, how do we have time, even during work, where we can have a quiet place where we can totally switch off? But I think, you know, to go back to the question, you know, corporate wellness is key. And actually, I think employees need to understand you know, how, they're, how they're supporting their teams to, and their staff to live this life. You know, it includes food, it includes water, it includes breaks. And it, and it also includes, you know, this kind of healthy time away from work. You know, increasingly people, depending on what industry you work in, there's more flexi time of people working from home. And now with this recent virus, maybe one of the positive things which will come from this is I can see employees allowing more people to work at home sometimes. Because I know for me, it's really productive. I've had it because I've been in my home, not moving. I'm working more, producing more than ever. And so it's, it's very productive. So I think this may change some of the kind of context, I think, around around this, which employees will help to give a balance to employees. Completely agree. Moving on to our uh, next question. No one likes being forced into situation. Right now, everyone has been forced into isolation. How does one trick the mind into enjoying this period of solitude? We have to believe that human beings have a very good ability to adapt to any situation, actually. Even, uh, even if we lose something in love, actually go through the four phases. Uh, uh, I forgot, anger, uh, reject, anger, grief, accept. So even the big events, we can finally get used or accept that or get used to that. Uh, so, but everyone has different speed to adapt. And uh, the first thing is we have to actually respect our own speed. Take as long as you need, whenever, whichever place you are, take as long as you need, be nice to yourself. And if you want, if, if you need, you can share your feeling with others. So yeah, that will help you adapt quicker or better. So that's my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, I think also, if I can just uh, add on to that, I mean, I think lots of challenges, we want to escape, right? I don't mean physically, of course, physically, we don't be in a home. 
but mentally, it comes to a problem of mentally we want to escape. So I don't think people should look into to kind of kid themselves or cheat themselves or find a kind of hack to pretend it's not happening, but actually the opposite. I think you need to become more conscious of what is happening and actually use the time really to reflect inwardly and actually to use this time. And I think that this is the opportunity as opposed to trying to mentally escape because to me, this adds to the stress. And in fact, you could say stress is really resistance, right? And mental stress is resistance to accepting the moment, you know, rather projecting our fears onto the moment, you know, you know, and how many times do we do this? Where we spend so much energy and time thinking about the worst case scenarios on everything. And in my personal experience, 99.9% time, it doesn't happen, right? It never happens. But our mind will give, take all this energy. And I think, so in a people in a situation, I think they need to use it not to escape mentally, but instead go do the opposite thing and become more conscious of what's happening and use it again as an opportunity to go within themselves. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, my daily routine has been lost. My wake up sleep timings are gone. I find myself aimlessly reading news on the virus and flickering through Netflix daily. I'm now an expert on cases and deaths in Spain and US. And I just live in Bangkok. What do I do to break my cycle? Right now, I'm not accountable to anyone, including myself. This is stressing me out, depressing me, making me lethargic and just down the dumps. What do I do to get a stable mindset? Actually, for that one, I think the first thing is, um, as I said, fear control. He, he should try to put himself on away and uh, limit the, the intake of negative information. So that's the part one. And, uh, and also, as I said, the basic bottom line uh, routine is very important for our well-being. So at least keep minimal. For example, even during the vacation or even during the holiday, I will ask my daughter said, well, you have to get up before 9.30 and you have to go to bed before 11, 11 o'clock. I know that's good for her mood, for her health, for everything. So it's routine is very important. And uh, another thing, when he talk about depression, uh, if you he can, he's not accountable, or blah, blah, blah. So these kind of things, it reminds me that the recent study about the stress, they said, actually the negative emotion is not so harmful or, or it, it will not kill you. Actually, it's all the thoughts coming, follow it. For example, oh, what's wrong with me? Why shouldn't I be that, uh, why, why shouldn't I be that way instead of this way? Uh, what can I do? Um, I, I must be like, what, what? All this thought is more harmful to, to your health, to your well-being. So try to stop blaming on himself, on her, on himself, and uh, take it easy, and uh, try to know. Okay, if she appear that way, actually it's good to just respect that and accept himself. So that's the. But the last thing actually I want to say is, I forgot. <laughs> okay, Jimmy. <laughs> no, look, I, I think it's um it's vital to have some kind of structure. I mean, if you, for all of us who have children, you know, we have these long summer holidays and the kids, you know, first it's great. And then they kind of, after a few weeks in, they kind of, they fall out of routine and it doesn't make them happy. So you almost have to, I think, look at yourself like a small child. What would you do with a small child? You would actually build some structure in regards to what time do I wake up at? What do I do during the day? And I'm not saying it becomes unrealistic or too burdensome, but actually you need some basic structure in regards to how your day looks what time you get up at, what you do, and movement. One of the best things you can do to change your brain chemistry is to move, right? And of course, we're slightly restricted now in regards to in our homes, and some people have bigger homes than others and can enjoy more space. But you know, the reality is now all these fitness providers are giving lots of free stuff out now online where people can do online things for free. And it's great. You know, it can be yoga, meditation we've spoken about, but more active to get the blood moving around the body. This is one of the best things you can do to one, just to make yourself feel more energized, and two, just to make yourself feel better about yourself. I suppose being yeah. sat at home, because the problem is you're at home, you know, the fridge is opening all the time, we're eating too much food, and um, you can fall into this habit, but it's not nice, it's not good, feel bad. So I think it's a basic structure that you need, time to go to sleep, things to do during the day, 
some exercise, and I think that will make a real massive difference. Yes, yeah. And we have five more minutes left, so probably we'll take two more questions. Uh, the next question is, what kind of sleep hours are important or ideal for controlling stress? What kind of sleep? Sleep hours. Sleep hours, ah, yeah. Yeah, based on the studies, it should be more, more than eight hours, or minimum okay. more than five hours, minimum more than five hours. Otherwise, the brain has not, not enough time to, to get rid of the garbage during the daytime. So, but we, but we recommend more than eight hours. Yeah. Okay. Look, the research as well, the research on sleep is increasingly telling us what we already know, but the thing about sleep, you can't, you can't make up for lack of sleep. You know, we all like to think weekends, we'll catch up with sleep because we haven't had much during the week. It doesn't work this way. It's almost you lose one night of sleep and you've lost forever. And it has, you know, occasionally it's fine, but if you live a life where you're, you're getting five hours, five and a half hours, it's not enough, and Grace was referring to it then, for the body to repair properly, for the brain to repair. You know, like when you sleep, your brain is going through a whole refiling, subconscious refiling of what you've been thinking and doing. And it's, you know, it's increasing, the research is showing that it takes, you, it takes years off your life. If you're not sleeping enough. And again, for most adults, like Grace said, it's normally eight hours, you know, At minimum, minimum six and a half, seven, but really eight hours. And this needs to be consistently part of your practice. And it's probably one of the most simple but profound things you can do for your well-being. Now moving on to our last question. Uh, clearly wellness retreats are more relevant now. What do I look out for when identifying a wellness retreat for my next solo holiday? So look, uh, it's great, great you're asking the person. <laughs> the, the, the reality is, look, of course, it depends what you want to do. You know, of course, it depends what you want to do and what kind of experience or what you recognize as kind of the need within yourself. You know, why are you looking for a wellness holiday? And of course, normal combination of different things. Some people have a very specific purpose of what they're trying to achieve. Some are just inquisitive. I think one of the phenomena we'll see after this virus ends is people, of course, will actually become increasingly aware of their health and well-being. And I think we'll see a, you know, a drive of people looking for, out for this type of product. So it's annual retreats, and I'll talk about our project for a second. You know, we're if a fully integrated health retreat, which means that actually, you know, we look at the person holistically, and we actually create a bespoke curated program based on, you know, what we think you need from your health perspective, and of course, what you're trying to achieve. Now, I think, so if you have an idea of what you're trying to achieve, of course, that helps, because then you can focus your, your research. Um, but either way, I think I'd recommend you look for retreats which can look at you holistically, um, and I mean mind, body, and spirit. You know, it's, you know, and this is, so it's an integrated approach to your health and well-being. Um, and that will normally give you the kind of the best results for what you're looking for. And then following from that, because obviously what a, what a health retreat is about really is a pit stop. You go in for a week or two weeks and you come, come out feeling refreshed. But then the key thing is, what can I take home with me? You know, what can I take back with me in regards to lifestyle changes? Because it's not great if, if it's just for 10 days of the year that you follow this regime. Of course, it really helps. But the point being, it's supposed to be a point of inflection where it gives you a kind of momentum to change some basic things in your life to improve your life. So I think retreats need to be holistic and broad enough to be able to treat every level of the person. Of course, the mind is key to all this. People think physically first, body first, but actually the mind where you have your beliefs and the grace is the life coach and psychologist. She can talk more about this, but that's kind of key. So I think you need to have a retreat which can actually, as well as giving you great programs, actually go into some of your help you with your, some of your beliefs and limited beliefs, because in the end, that will, that will design your life for you. If you will have limited beliefs, that's probably the first thing that we should be helping you with. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie and Grace, uh, for this wonderful session. I think the session has been enlightening and engaging, and I'm sure we've all gained useful insight, which we're going to apply uh, from here on. Mm -hmm.